That's the first one? Yeah, and that's 63. Okay. This church, good to have you here. Those that are in the back that hear my voice, if you can make your way in, let's all stand and we are going to open our service in prayer today. Good to see you all here. What a blessing. We're starting to fill up. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for every person that has come live today and gathered with us. Thank you for those that are joining us online. Thank you that we have gathered together to worship our Savior. And so we pray today that His name would be lifted up and magnified, that You would direct our attention, Father, to the fact that we are here today to worship You. We ask You to bless Your Word as it is preached and expounded on. Bless the singing as we lift up our voices and lift up our hearts in song. Bless our prayers, bless our giving. Father, we pray for those that are still on their way, that you bring them here safely. And we thank you. Father, we do not take any day for granted, and we understand that if you gave us only today and no more after this, that we have still been abundantly blessed. We thank you for being a good God. And we pray today that you'd be glorified, and we ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may remain standing. All right, stick our hymnals. We'll open up to hymn 13. Crown him with many crowns. Hymn 1 3. Oh, uh, 
Amen. You may be seated. I uh, just I guess we just have the one announcement, yeah. our business meeting, which will be April 21st at 7 p.m. It'll be here and uh, on Zoom. So uh, first business meeting of the year. We didn't have one last year for the first quarter, so it's something new. All right. So let, let's now, we'll, we'll bow in prayer as uh, we play the offertory and uh, give up front, or you can give it in the back as you leave. Let's bow in prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you for your abundant blessing, Lord. We thank you for the rain, for the sun, Lord, for spring flowers, uh, the new life that uh, uh, shows us every spring, Lord. And we think of your uh, this past uh, Easter, Lord, as you rose again for all of us, Lord. We ask that you would... Be with us, guide us, and protect us. Bless this offering, Lord. Be with those who can give and those who can't. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. blessing to have many of you here today and to have the entire noble family with us what a blessing what a big blessing um once you be praying for my family appreciate uh, you pray those of you that prayed for my wife and my daughters uh, they did what's called a spartan race they are on their way home. they survived although my wife did text me and say i'm done i'm dead so i assume but for her to text that i assume she's still living they are flying back now and they should be joining us tonight I'd like you to take your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 9 for our scripture reading. Luke chapter 9. What did I say? I said tonight? Oh, my wife's coming back. She'll be here tonight, yes. All right, Luke chapter 9. When you get there, let's all stand for the reading of God's Word. Luke chapter 9. I'm going to begin reading in verse 57 and, and read to the end of the chapter and then we will remain standing in prayer. <laughs> I want to remind you to be praying for our sister Amelia. Uh, she will be meeting with the surgeon tomorrow. Uh, so we want to be praying for God to work in that way, in a great way. All right, verse 57, Luke chapter 9, beginning of verse 57. The Bible says, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord... I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another said, also said, Lord... I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at my, ha uh, my home, are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man 
having his put his, having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. May God bless his word. Let's bow together in prayer. Our God, we're grateful for the opportunity and the privilege we have to gather together with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for those that are able to join us online. Thank you for those that will be dropping in uh, out of curiosity. And we just pray that today uh, your word would captivate our attention. We pray, Father, that you would use your word as we consider the teachings of our Savior, as we consider what saith the Lord. And I pray that you would speak to our hearts today. Pray, Father, that you would help those that name the name of Christ to stay on point in our lives, to stay on course for what you've called us to do. Help us to see the bigger picture and help us not to get distracted. And we ask your blessing today on your word. We want to lift up Sister Amelia to you. And Father, we would cry out to you on her behalf. Pray that you would give her your perfect peace. Lord, I want to thank you for the testimony that she has been, uh, not just in this recent challenge that you've put her through, but throughout her life. Thank you for bringing her here from Liberia so many years ago. Thank you for her family, for bringing them behind uh, with her. And, And Lord, thank you for her testimony. Thank you that it was my privilege, Lord, to have my children see this woman and continue to observe her and her family and lord we just lift her to you and pray for a great work of healing pray that this would just be a a medical bump in the road uh, that you would grant her many more years should jesus tarry and father we ask your blessing today on every aspect of our service and we ask it in jesus name amen you may be seated where my Savior died and were for cleansing from sin I cried there to my heart was the blood applied glory to his name glory to his name glory to his name there to my heart was the blood
All right, it's good to have you this morning. Please take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 9. Go back to Luke chapter 9. This morning, I want to address the issue of getting distracted uh, because that is a, an issue uh, that I find people get saved, people begin their Christian walk, and they often get distracted and sidetracked. Some of them we call casualties. Uh, some we wonder, did they even get saved to begin with? Some of them, it becomes evident over time uh, that they were saved. Uh, they just, you know, fell aside for a little while. It's always a blessing to see people get back up on the horse and go back and walk with Christ and continue with Him. Uh, but we want to talk about this idea of getting distracted in light of what Jesus said. As He, here in Luke chapter 9, He's getting ready to commission His 70 disciples to go forth to preach Christ and to preach the kingdom. He's, he's sending them forth. And I had mentioned just last week or two weeks ago, I made the statement that Luke was an apostle. And as soon as it came out of my mouth, I realized, no, he's not an apostle. Um, so that's a detraction right there, just a correction from that. But Luke uh, may very well have been one of the 70 that was commissioned here. He would end up becoming an a important disciple of the Lord, an author of the scriptures. Usually, historically, he is identified as Luke the Evangelist. But Luke is writing, and he shares this event as Jesus is ready to commission the 70 to go forth for ministry. And it says in verse 57, it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Now, this is in response his challenge in this previous in, in the entire chapter to forsake all and follow me the theme is discipleship and so here's someone that's saying lord i'm going to follow you wherever you go and jesus says in verse 58 foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests but the son of man hath not where to lay his head now usually you think this is not the way to promote people following you Immediately sharing how difficult it's going to be. Jesus meant no, no, no words about that. Discipleship would have a cost. He said to another in verse 59, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And by the way, this is, you know, sometimes people will look at this and say, Wow, Jesus was so cold hearted. His dad just died. And he won't even let he won't even give him the, the respect of burying his father. The idea of this, most believe that he was not saying, you know, my dad just died. Let me go bury him. No, you put me first. The idea is that he's waiting until his dad gets older and is not part of his life, and then he's going to come serve. And that's the if you look at the thrust of where this is heading, it is all people that are making excuses why they should not have to follow Christ. Verse sixty. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Verse 61, Another said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them, bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And now here's verse 62. This is what we're going to look at today. If you are a born-again believer, I want to challenge you regarding your walk with Christ, putting Jesus Christ first. Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. May God bless his word. Let's bow in prayer, and we're going to consider this in a couple other texts today. Father, help us this morning as we rejoice at the opportunity as things are beginning to open up and we're beginning to feel a little more comfortable with fellowshipping together and people are coming back. And thank you for those that are joining us online. Please use your word. Father, every one of us that name your name, Lord, we want to follow you. We want to walk close to you. But we understand from past experience that it is not easy, Lord. There are things that will set us aside. There are things that get people discouraged. There are things that just get us off track. And before we realize it, uh, we're not where we want to be and we're not where we started out. And Lord, my prayer is that you would encourage 
your children today to understand the nature and the necessity, first of all, of putting Christ first, and then also the nature of distractions so that we might be wiser after the next half hour, 40 minutes, Lord, that we might be wiser because we've met together and studied your word, that we might be aware of the pitfalls, and most importantly, Father, that we would be determined that we are going to set our eyes straight before us and ponder the path of our feet. We're not going to turn to the left or the right, that we are going to pursue you and walk with you until you call us home or Christ returns. So Lord, we ask your blessing today in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So let's talk about distractions, because Jesus said, again in verse 62, no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Now this is a picture which everybody there was very, very familiar with. And millions of people since then can understand this. Uh, People that have anything to do with agriculture and all those places where in order to make a living, you had to to till the land. And so it's a reference to the plow. When somebody was plowing their field, so before they could ever plan anything, uh, if they're going to plow, and and apparently in in the east, the plows were used to be uh, lighter, and they used to be apparently very difficult to maneuver. They would, uh, they would turn over quite easy. So when you're, you're guiding a plow, trying to make furrows, and you know, just uh, the carpenters talked about planting and gardening yesterday. So imagine you're tilling your garden, and you've got the plow, and the key thing, and this is, everybody could understand, they knew what Jesus was talking about. If you're going to plow, and you're going to make a furrow, You've got to keep your eyes, especially if you have mules that are unruly or oxen, and then you've got a plow that's not so sturdy. You want to make sure if you're going to plow in straight lines. By the way, that's critical. Because if you don't plow in straight lines and you go wavering, you're going to take up a lot of land and not get your most money for the seeds that you want to plant. So your very economy, your very livelihood is at stake so what you do when you're plowing is you keep your eyes straight on. You, you, you just, it reminds me of, and this is my limited experience, never plowed before. I've dug holes in the sand at the shore, but I have cut lawns. And it's the same way. You know, I remember when you cut, when you cut the lawn, you look for the track. And so when you're plowing, you look straight ahead. And as easy as it is to wonder, you know, how am I doing, the tendency would be to just, Check back and see, am I making straight furrows? But apparently that's the big no-no that Jesus is talking about. Because as soon as you and I turn back to see how we're doing, we are now distracted and we have greater chance of going astray. Now, of course, this is all an analogy. He's not really giving agricultural advice. Like there'd be people going, I never thought of that. That's why I don't plow in straight lines. Oh, thank you. No, he's using this as a picture for our lives. And when it comes to the Lord, the kingdom of God, he's talking about those. Now, this, he, he's preaching the gospel. He's preaching himself. And he's about ready to send forth 70 of his followers that are going to go and preach the gospel. And he wants to challenge them. First of all, for themselves, about the need to be steadfast. And those that respond and end up becoming followers of Jesus Christ. It is imperative that those people that start in the Christian life keep their eyes focused on the prize before them. Paul talked about about that. In the same idea what Jesus was saying when he says, Uh, You know, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark. He keeps his eyes right on. How appropriate, how necessary is that simple challenge to you and I who name the name of Christ? Think about what's at stake. 
the souls of other people, our ability to represent Christ properly and talk to them about what Jesus Christ did for them on Calvary. Think of how much is at stake for us laying up treasure in heaven when we get sidetracked. We are only given a limited amount of time on this earth. And how important it is that you and I keep our eyes focused and not look back. Not get distracted. Let's talk about the word distracted. It's an English word that, like many of ours, either comes from Latin or Greek. And uh, in this case, it's Latin. And it comes from the word to draw. To draw away. To draw in a different direction. And the idea of that is to draw our attention away. That's what distraction is. Distracting is when you and I have our attention, which was on something, turned away, drawn away to something else. And the implication is something less significant. Something less important. Take, for example, distracted driving. It is, it is tragic today. Uh, the United States says that uh, or in statistics... Distracted driving has claimed the lives uh, of about 3,500 people every year. 3,500 people in our country die, approximately die every year because they look down at their phone for just a few seconds while they're driving. 42% of high school students across the United States admit to texting or emailing while driving. Distracted driving accounts for 27% of all crashes. This was the study that was done a couple years ago, most recent one. And they say that distracted driving claims eight lives a day on average. Eight lives a day. In our country, eight people will probably die today. About eight. There'll, there'll be some that will die simply because they took their eyes off the road just for a moment. Used to be to check the radio. Now it's cell phones, isn't it? Or to get something to eat or whatever it is. Distracted driving kills people. I remember a, year, a couple years ago, Upper Darby High School had a crashed car parked right in front of the, 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 the property with a sign, and it said something like, distracted driving killed three people in this car. Man, that's effective. When you see... You think about it, somebody, you know, a, a group of people set out one day and they were not planning on dying that day, but just for a few seconds, they took their eyes off the road and it cost them their lives. Thousands, 3,500 every day. Well, what did Jesus say? He said again in verse 62, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back, Again, he's not freaking out about agriculture like, you know, if you don't make right lines, he's talking about life. How important it is for us when we've, start, when we've started something as important as serving Christ. Think of the 70 people that are listening to this, ready to go forth. They're, they're given their mission. Okay, I'm going to serve Jesus. I'm going to go out and represent him. And Jesus is telling me something here that is critical for me to be success, successful as his disciple. One commentator made this statement about this verse. He said, The ambition to make a straight furrow has been common to plowmen in all ages and countries, and it needs, like the highest calling, steady intention and a forward cast eye. Think about that in light of the, the picture. If you and I are going to serve Christ and walk with Him, it requires steady intention and a forward cast eye. You know what? That's what Proverbs 4, verse 25 and 26 says. Listen to, listen to what the Bible says. Let thine eyes look right on and thine eyelids straight before thee, ponder the path of thy feet. 
Let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand or to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Isn't that good? When you and I are serving the Lord, whatever God has given us to do, it is so important that you and I keep our focus on what God has called us to do. Turn not to the right hand or to the left. You ever done that? You ever had your eye on the prize and you did what God called you to do and then all of a sudden something happened that you did not anticipate and it derailed you. First thing that comes to my mind is the numerous bitter people that used to be a part of this church or any church that got offended or got hurt or hadn't, didn't have their expectations met. And they became bitter. And now they are casualties, no longer serving Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible uses a lot of illustrations of the sport, the competitive sporting area, you know, of that arena to illustrate our walk with Christ, running a race, 1 Corinthians 9, sparring. I mean, there's a lot of sports illustrations. And there are a lot that can give us a little insight. I'm not a big golfer, but you, many of you know Arnold Palmer. He shares this story that uh, it was the final hole of the 1961 Masters Tournament. He had a one-stroke lead, and he said, I just hit a very satisfying tee shot, and I felt like I was in pretty good shape. And as I approached my ball, out of the corner of my eye, I saw an old friend in the gallery. And he, and he beckoned me. He said, hey, Arnold. And, and, I, and he said, I went over, and I went, and I shook his hand. And as soon as I shook his hand, I knew that I had lost my focus. And he ended, he ended up losing the, what was it? The, he ended up losing the Masters because of that. Now, was he blaming that guy? You made me lose the masters. No, he blamed himself. He understood that that temporary lack of focus, that lack of keeping his eyes on the attention, that's what cost him. He wasn't blaming anyone else, nor should you and I blame anyone else when you and I get sidetracked in our walk for the Lord. And that is very easy to do. We live in a society where we've got to blame people you know, if we're frustrated about something, we want to blame others. Folks, you and I, we need to take responsibility. Yes, there are reasons why we get distracted, but you and I alone are responsible for keeping our eyes where they need to be. And of course, that is on Jesus Christ. Which brings up another illustration. There's this new thing. Oh, it's really not new. In fact, the illustration I'm going to give you goes way back in time. Those of you baseball fans remember Yogi Berra and Hank Aaron. And uh, I only, Johnny come lately, baseball player or baseball fan. I'm not a player. But as you know, I love hockey. And they have this new thing. I never heard this when I was in high school. They have this new thing called chirping. You ever heard of that? Which is appropriate in a day and age where we talk about people tweeting chirping how many how many of you never heard of chirping okay so a good number of you okay chirping is basically just trash talk okay you know what that is right and and i know they do it in other sports too and, and apparently yogi berra was like a great chirper before they had chirping uh and, and they have it in hockey all the time there's certain flyer players that they're they, they chirp i remember the first time i heard that i'm like He's chirping? I don't, I don't hear him chirping. And then I realized that they're just, they're just hassling, and it's like they just constantly talk to try to distract the opponent. And apparently there's like a whole lingo, whole jargon system of words that they use to try to distract, at least in the NHL, in the, in the hockey there are. And there are certain things that they'll say. I, a couple of them I thought were pretty profound. I'll have to use this next time I play hockey. Uh, guys would say to the goalie, Hey, goalie, I have coupons that save more than you do. Or here's another one. Hey, goalie, why don't you get Geico so you can save more? You know, I mean, the, those kind of things, what have they done? They're just done to rattle the opponent, just to get them 
disturbed and off focus. Because focus is important. So apparently Yogi Berra was a trash talker, a chirper. And Hank Aaron, it was the World Series, and Hank Aaron uh, was getting, he, you know, he was the slugger at the time of the Milwaukee, the Milwaukee Braves. And he got up to bat, and Yogi, Yogi Berra said, um, I, have it, I want to make sure I get this right. He said, hey, Henry, you're holding the bat wrong. You're supposed to hold it so you can read the trademark. And Hank Aaron didn't even acknowledge it. And the next pitch, he, he hit it out of the park. And then as he goes around and he comes back to tag in the plate, Aaron looked at Yogi Bear and he said, just matter of factly, he said, I didn't come up here to read. You know? And I love that. Because that's, here's a man, again, it's sports, but the Bible uses sports illustrations because our life is like, a race. Our life is like a, you know, World Series. We, we, we've got to keep our eye on the focus. And, and what happens is Satan wants to get us distracted. And when you and I get distracted, that's exactly where he wants us. By the way, I know this is not a Bible verse. But I think I can confidently say that Satan is the ultimate chirper. Is he not? Does he not have the ability to put suggestions in our minds? You know, clearly we find in Scripture, he'll put thoughts in people's minds. He is the accuser of the brethren. He wants to distract you from being all that you can be for Jesus Christ. And he has succeeded in many lives by things that he says chirping in their ears to get them sidetracked i want to ask you something first of all by the way let's back up satan's the ultimate distractor you know jesus said what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul what's the most important issue that every human being should focus on charlie mentioned this in sunday school this morning when he was talking about um someone from the past i forget which character in the past uh, would look ahead to us that now have the revelation of Jesus Christ. And they, they would probably say, I cannot believe there's people that would, they know the detail you know about the Messiah and they don't get saved. Remember that, Charlie? Who was that you were talking about? Just in general. I thought it might have been Enoch or one of them Old Testament characters. But they would look at that. And they would say, I can't believe that you don't have Jesus Christ. So think about it. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What is one of the biggest things Satan wants to do to distract the world? Is to get their eyes off what the most important thing in the world is. That's why Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. That's the most important thing. By the way, if that is not up there on your priority list, if you're not seeking what happens in eternity and the afterlife and you're not you're just living for the here and now you've gotten distracted with me you probably don't even realize it you may have got you may have all the ducks in order for your life here on earth but if you're not preparing for eternity what will it profit if you gain the whole world and lose your soul turn to turn to hebrews chapter 10 please hebrews chapter 10 we're seeing three things today. I'll give you my outline now. A little late, but better late than never. First is the illustration of putting your hand to the plow and not turning back. Then we find the intention of that statement and others. What's the Lord looking for in our lives? And now he addresses believers, people who have made professions of faith. And he's kind of following up with, the, we, we studied this not too long ago in our adult Bible study in Hebrews chapter 6. About the, It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift. If they fall away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. And so the writer of Hebrews was convinced that he was talking to believers. But he was talking about this possibility of falling away from the faith. What we would call apostasy. And look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 38. Now the just shall live... By faith. 
Now he's actually quoting from Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4, quoting from a Greek version of the Old Testament. He says, because that's the one that he quotes from, it's a little bit different than the Hebrew. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So he's, he's quoting scripture and he's adding uh, an application regarding those that fall away. Now, again, the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. That's God speaking to the person that starts out on the Christian faith, on the, in the Christian race, and then falls back. And then verse 39, but we are not of them who draw back under perdition. So, and that picks up with what he was saying in verse 6. You know, we are persuaded better things of you, things that accompany salvation. So it's like, okay, here's people that started the Christian race. They got sidetracked. And there are going to be people that were, are apostates who never were saved. And the writer is saying, but I'm persuaded that doesn't apply to you. And he's saying the same thing here. Um, again, we are not of them that draw back under perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So the challenge is for you and I, folks. We have got something so important because however much time we have on this earth, people are entering into eternity by the thousands. If it was 153,000 a day, I forget the exact number, people that will die today and enter into eternity every day. And you and I are challenged to give them the hope of the gospel. You know, D.L. Moody once made a statement that has been often quoted, and since I don't have it before me, I'm going to paraphrase D.L. Moody. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to get it close enough. He said this, he said, The world has yet to see what God can do with one person totally, completely surrendered to Him. That's the idea. And then he might have even said after it, I want to be that person. And I love that sentiment. He says, you know, and, and he lived in the 1800s. He said, the world has yet to see what God can do with one person totally surrendered to him. And that's true. And I love that sentiment. I want to be that person. Now, you know, D.L. Moody lived, when I looked at his time, there was another man that lived on this earth that I'm learning more and more about that is like be quickly becoming my hero, one of my heroes. And he actually was, he lived on this earth around the same time D.L. Moody did. Moody would, have been a, Moody would have been about 20 years older than him. So depending on when Moody made that statement, there might have been a man on this earth who the world was going to see seemed to be totally devoted to him. And his name is Robert Dick Wilson. Probably nobody ever heard of him. Robert Dick Wilson. He was um, born, in again, 20 years after D.L. Moody in um, the late 1860-something. 18, and he was very gifted as a theologian and a preacher. And early in his life, after he got saved, he would go around. He went traveling to study because he had this incredible ability to learn languages like no one else. And apparently he was also a very good preacher. And uh, he made this statement. I want to read to you from Robert Dick Wilson because the guy's a genius. I've I told you before, one of the King James translators, his name was Lancelot Andrews. You remember me talking about him? He had, he, this man, like many of the translators, he had, he was fluent in 15 modern languages and also fluent in five ancient languages no six he had 21 languages that he was fluent in and people that write about Lancelot Andrews will often say he could have been the interpreter general at the Tower of Babel I love that I thought that was clever do you know that Robert Dick Wilson like beats Lancelot Andrews Robert Dick Wilson mastered at least 26 different languages and dialects, and some that study said uh, he knew actually uh, about 45 different languages. The guy was incredible. He, at the age of 15, he was ready and, and accepted to go to college. No, the age of 13, I'm, I'm wrong. At the age of 13, he was accepted into college and ready to go, and then he got sick. So he wasn't able to go to college until he was 15. So you know what he did? 
He learned five new languages during those two years. I mean, the guy's amazing. And he said this, this statement, because he went to travel in Heidelberg, and uh, regarding his decision in life, he said, when I went to Heidelberg, I found I hadn't the strength to be a preacher and a teacher both. So I decided to be a teacher. Now listen to the laser focus of this man. He said, I thought the world needed a man who was fitted as I was to learn languages. See, here's what was happening. In the universities, liberalism and modernism was starting to creep in, and there were people that were starting to deny some of the fundamentals of the faith. Like Princeton Theological Seminary, um, there were just starting to be teachers that were coming in that didn't believe that the Old Testament was really the Word of God. And that was his specialty. He had a burden to defend the historicity and, and the integrity of the Old Testament, specifically the book of Daniel. And this passion started early. And so he said, I thought the world needed a man who was fitted as I was, so I decided that I would give my life just to that one thing, the defense of the Old Testament. And by the way, for almost 30 years, he taught in Princeton Theological Seminary addressing and, and really hitting them right on. He would challenge these skeptics that were saying that the Old Testament couldn't be depended on. And he said, you tell me any language where you think the Old Testament, because of that language, has been disqualified. And he said, if I don't know it, I will learn that language and I will show you where you're wrong. And his writings are incredible, defending the integrity of the Old Testament. I wish I knew about Robert Dick Wilson when I went to Penn State. I told you I went to Penn State. You know what they taught? Remember I told you I took religious studies so I could learn the Bible more? <laughs> That's a joke. That's a joke because uh, good old Mr. Stevens, the religious studies teacher, didn't believe the Bible. And he taught the J-E-P-D-H theory, I think it is. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm a new Christian, and I'm in... in trying to learn the Bible, and they're telling me that, you know, Isaiah and the Old Testament wasn't really written by one author. It was actually J-E-P-D. And they had this whole theory to disprove the integrity of the Old Testament. I wish I had known about Robert Dick Wilson because I could have read just a couple of his booklets and I could have gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with that teacher. I didn't know there was a guy in the late, 19, you know, in the late 1800s and early 1900s that had already taken care of that and fought the battle. In fact, Robert Dick Wilson ended up leaving Princeton Theological Seminary, which, do you know, by the way, that, that Princeton Theological Seminar Seminary has a cemetery? And do you know that their cemetery is more scriptural and, and will give you a better Bible education than their seminary? Seriously, because you've got all these great teachers that used to believe the Bible, and on their headstones is like all this sound theology, which you're not going to get in the seminary. In fact, some people call it Princeton Theological Cemetery now because it's dead spiritually. But this Robert Dick Wilson was amazing. The man, and he knew. So listen, listen to how razor sharp his focus was. He, he had a plan. And this is where, oh, what, a, what an amazing man. He said, my family, or he said, I thought the world needed a man who was fitted as I was. He's like, okay, should I be a preacher or should I be a teacher? Because of his gift for language, he said, I decided that I would give my life to just that one thing, the defense of the Old Testament. My family was noted for its longevity, and I felt I might reasonably live until I was 70. So I div divided my life into 15-year periods. Listen to the plan. So, so the first 15 years, I was going to study all the languages. And then he had the, the point three under that. Like, first the Semitic languages and everything that threw light on the vocabulary of the Old Testament. Then after that, I was going to study um, the ancient, or the, the Ethiopic, the Phoenician, the Babylonian, the Assyrian, and a number of others that would shed light on the history of the Old Testament. And then after that, I would learn the languages that would throw light on the text of the Old Testament. So he did that for 15 years. Then the next 15 years, he studied what is called lower criticism. And by the way, please take note. When people hear textual criticism, they automatically think that somebody's criticizing the Bible and doesn't believe it. 
Kind of like an apologist is someone who apologizes for the Bible. No, it's just the opposite. An apologist defends the Bible. And a textual critic in and of itself simply means someone that studies the languages of Scripture. The King James translator, every translator is a textual critic. So he said, the next 15 years I'm going to study lower criticism. And that's the one that's just studying the text of the Old Testament. And then he said, the last 15 years of my life, I am going to study everything I can about higher criticism. And that's the ones that don't believe the Bible. Those are the ones that tear apart the Bible. Those are the ones that uh, infiltrated into our seminaries at, at the turn of the century. And that's exactly what he had at Princeton. And he fought that until finally he realized that it was dead. And he went and helped start Westminster Seminary, which was the conservative alternative to Princeton. But this man was a genius. And to read his refutation of those who rejected the Old Testament and rejected the book of Daniel is brilliant. How did he get, oh, by the way, how did he get this way? How could he learn? By the time, by the time he got to college, he already knew like 20-some languages. And while he was learning some others, he also taught some of them. Can you imagine that while he's in college? And somebody asked him, how did you become so brilliant? He said, spare time. He said, that's how I learned all these languages. He said, it was my spare time. He said, when I, before I went into college, I was given a Hebrew lexicon, a Hebrew Bible, and another Hebrew study help, and I just taught myself. I'd read the first page, and I'd read it and read it in my spare time. Wow. See, there's someone that was not distracted. There was, I mean, he had a plan, 15 years, 15 years, 15 years, and he stuck to it. Sadly, he died in, uh, like I think it was 1930. He had just started helping Westminster, and he gave, a, 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 gave an oration, gave a lecture at Westminster, which is, by the way, brilliant in what it says, and then sadly he died. And we could, you know, Bible-believing Christians could have used a Robert Dick Wilson for a little bit longer. But again, how, he, he said, all in my spare time. Here was a man who did not get distracted. He had his eye on the prize, and man, did God use him in a big way. I submit to you, how do you use your time? Because God can use any one of us here if you and I will not allow ourselves to get distracted. Final point, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, the indiscretion. This is where we are challenged. The idea kind of of putting our hand to the plow and then looking back. Paul writes to Timothy, challenges him as a young, his young men, you know, ward that he's, that he's spiritually, he was the, the mentor. And in 2 Timothy chapter four, uh, 2 and verse 4, Paul told Timothy, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. I submit to you that if you and I are going to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ, we've got to be conscious of how the devil wants to get us sidetracked. By the way, some people get sidetracked because they got sidetracked. And what I mean by that is this. Some people allow themselves to get their eyes off the prize and they make a left turn. Ever done that? But here's the difference. The devil is going to use that to try to beat you up and get you to just get fixated on, you've you got your hand on the plow, you're looking back and you're like, oh my goodness, look how horrible the furrow is. And you're, you're going, like looking behind, just looking at how bad and how squiggly your lines are and you forget that you still got more to do. You know how many people have their hand at the plow and they just, they're still turned around. And they're still going, maybe, you know, but they're so focused on the past. That's what the devil does. And he's a master of it. I, I, it's been, it's not new either. 
David, when David prayed, David said, Lord, remember not the sins of my youth. I've actually prayed that prayer many times. You ever done, stu- done foolish things? Not just in your youth. Who hasn't done foolish things? And so our challenge is, don't allow the devil to get you. I- I've used this illustration before, and I like it. It's not one with the, the plow. It's one with a car. I'm talking about distracted. Don't get your eyes focused in the rearview mirror. It's almost, I mean, it's good if you want to know what's behind you. But if you've ever tried to drive forward while only looking in the, in the rearview mirror, not quite as bad as texting, but you're going to be doing a little squiggly driving. May God help us, beloved. We have something so important. And we have to just be aware. The devil wants to distract us. I want to close with this. It's an illustration that helped me to realize the nature of things. And it's a, it's a story from Russia from years ago. Um, I believe it was during the reign of Nikita Khrushchev. And they noticed that the, the uh, thievery was on the rise in, in all their manufacturing areas. And so they hired all these people in all these different factories to stand guard because people were taking stuff. The, something was happening. And so the story is told in one factory. The man that was assigned to be the guard knew all the employees very well. And the very first day he was stationed, you know, the guard, someone came out with a wheelbarrow f- with a full sack of something. And he started, you know, leaving the factory, starting to head out. And the guard knew this guy. I think his name was Petrov something. And he said, Petrov, what do you have there? His challenge is, I'm going to guard this. I'm not going to let anything get out of here. Petrov said, oh, it's just a bunch of sawdust. The guard said, yeah, right, open it up. So he opened up the sack, poured it out, and it was sawdust. All right, put it back. So he let him put the sawdust back, and he let him go home. Next day, same thing. And, And he... Two or three nights had happened in a row, and he said, "What?" And he, and, and he just opened it up. Sure enough, it was sawdust. Finally, he kept doing it after a while, and, the, and because he had this relationship with him, he said, all right, wait a minute, something's going on here. Would you tell me what you're doing, and I won't report you? And so for some reason, I guess they had that relationship. The young man, Petrov, said, I'm not stealing sawdust. I'm stealing wheelbarrows. And every night... I take a different wheelbarrow, you know. I mean, it's, 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 this is how it works. He got distracted, and that was the purpose of the bag of sawdust. If he could get his eyes off what was really happening, how many times does that happen? Where you and I get our eyes, our focus, off what we're supposed to be doing. Praise God. First of all, folks, there is mercy with the Lord. I love this verse. I'll close with it. There is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. And to fear God, as you know, is a good thing. It's the beginning of wisdom. It's, it's what happens when we get right with God, when we get saved, and when we start walking with Him. And it's, you know, there is forgiveness with God so that He can be feared. Well, yes, it's true. Our God is He's holy. He's just. He has to punish sin. But if He were only holy and just, we're all toast aren't we? I mean, there's no hope. And so it's like, why even try? If he's just standing there waiting for, okay, you step out of line, zap. If he's just that kind of a God that only judges and there's no forgiveness or mercy, then, then he's not the God of the second chance. But he is the God of the second chance and third chance and so on. So I want to challenge you. Have you gotten distracted from maybe you got saved maybe you started out and you were really doing well you did devotions and you know how devotions are the devil i think the devil helps us when we're doing devotions to just start falling asleep you ever started your devotions wide awake and as soon as you start reading you get maybe some of you have given up on just doing your devotional time walking with the lord reading your bible praying how important is that devil doesn't want you doing that all those things and we could talk about so many but we're out of time i want to just challenge you christian if you've been distracted who hasn't you just repent of your sins 
confess to the Lord, get back on track, and determine, I am not, you know, I'm going to put my hand to the plow. All right, forget, I'm not going to look in the back because, man, those rows are messed up. But I've still got this much left of acres to farm. That's what I'm going to focus on. That's why Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth, I press toward the mark. Folks, let's fix our eyes on Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, help us. Because we are easily distracted. As the songwriter wrote, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Father, help us. Help us to realize that you are a merciful God. And that those times of convicting are meant to simply get us on our knees so we can repent. Not to beat us up so that we become useless forever. So Lord, help us to repent of our sins put it under the blood, and then get back on track or get on track so that our eyes are fixed on you. Lord, help us as we re-grip, perhaps, maybe for the twelfth time, as we re-grip that plow. Help us, Lord, to not look back. Lord, help us to be worthy disciples because so much is at stake. Lord, we'll thank you for it. Bless us convict us, help us to make the changes that we need to uh, without being daunted and without being distracted so that we might press on for you. And we thank you, Lord. We pray, ask for your blessing in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, take your hymn books out. Let's all stand. Dave's going to come and lead us in a closing hymn. Hymn 3, 4, 2. Not have forgotten but what I received Grace has bestowed it since I have believed Boasting excluded, pride I abase Am only a sinner saved by grace Only a sinner saved by grace Only a sinner saved by Glory to God be the glory, am only a sinner, saved by grace. Have I told you some sin of my heart, counting my footsteps from God to depart? Jesus that found me, happy my case, am now am a sinner, saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story to God be the glory. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Okay, we're going to end right there. All right, you may be seated just for a moment. We want to say goodbye. To all of the, those of you that are online, we're, we're having a giveaway. We're going to give away $10,000 to everyone's here. Oh, it's a shame you're not here. I'm only kidding. <laughs> only kidding. Uh, are we off yet? Okay. All right. We're definitely.